lecture and to the public lecture entitled Democracy and Corruption by His Excellency Mr. Mons Wigatov from National Parliament of Denmark. I'm so sorry if it, the pronounce is difficult. <laughs> I have I tried to learn it this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Ligatov and the delegation are visiting Indonesia uh, to visit the Indonesian Parliament. I understand it is under the scheme of interparliamentary union. It is an honor for her to have you at in, in Indonesia and to host you at the University of Indonesia. For the first uh, program, I would like to invite uh, Rector of Universitas Indonesia, Professor Dr. Gumner Rusliwa Sumantri, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure that we have with us today His Excellency Mons Lukachov, the Speaker of the Danish Parliament. He is a member of the governing Social Democratic Party during his political career. He has held post he has held posts such as finance minister and foreign minister and has also been a leader of the Social Democratic Party. Mr Lukato Welcome to our to the, the beautiful campus, beautiful green campus of Universitas Indonesia, and also welcome to everyone who are coming here today. We are very happy to have you here in Indonesia because it will give me. It will give us also an excellent opportunity to learn a little about your country, Denmark. I'm pretty sure that few people in Indonesia know that much uh, about it, except perhaps for a pop group, Michael Learns to Rock. <laughs> who are very popular <laughs> here as well. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Denmark is one of the Nordic countries. It is now run by a center-left coalition led by your own party. The Social Democrats, the party leader, Hel Thorning Schmidt, is the country's first female prime minister. Denmark has been called a role model for Europe and the rest of the world. You have a dynamic economy and a very solid social security. Denmark is a welfare state. You value economic equity for all your citizens. You also have a dynamic liberal labor market. Denmark has a number of characteristics. First, firstly, educational qualifications are distributed quite evenly with both men and women working. Secondly, a progressive taxation system distributes wealth to pay for public services such as education, ch child care, health care, and the care of the elderly. The third here, 
the gap between rich and poor is less than in many other countries. And the poor taxation is heavy but does not harm employment. This is a very, let's say, good uh, system. Yeah. It has a highly effective and user-friendly public sector where corruption is ex extremely rare. The Danish model shows that it is possible to, to provide both economic growth and also social justice. This is an attractive model, but it is but is it applicable to Indonesia? This is a very important question. So, lesson learned from your country, His Excellency. I would like to ask you, you could we pursue social democratic policies here in a large de developing country with a very different characteristic to Denmark? Can we achieve economic growth in the globalized, globalized economic market with, without sacrificing social and economic justice and democracy? Could we be a prosperous and share that prosperity equitably? This is a very, these are very basic questions. Indonesia is now being characterized very differently than it was a decade ago. We have democratic government, a strong economy, a free press, and strong social institu institutions. We also are now investing more in higher education. Perhaps, most importantly, we have traditional values such as tolerance and harmony, and we have a staggeringly rich cultural diversity. At Universitas Indonesia, we have been trying hard to make the, cha the change that are needed to transform a highly respected, respected Respect the respected public university with a century and a half of tradition into one that can truly compete in the global marketplace. We are not there yet, but we have made huge progress. For example, our world ranking has gone from 395 to 217 in just five years. The number of publication in international journal increased tremendously. So from uh, a few number into almost 400 articles annually. Your Excellency, we are representing one of the oldest and the biggest university in the country. We established in 1849 during the Dutch colonial period. And we have now 50,000 students with 6,000 faculty members. I think that Danes and Indonesians have much to learn from each other. For example, it will be good if our civil servants were able to provide a similar quality of service to the public as yours. Exchanges and tra training in public administration will help to fight corruption. It is also apparent that you are people who value press freedom, and this is something we have seen get stronger in recent years here. Ethics and principle in the news media might be another area for us to talk about. On the other hand, Indonesia 
being such a diverse society has a great deal of experience in areas such as cultural and religious diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps our value of social harmony could be something to assist Denmark in its integration of immigrants workers into society. Universitas Indonesia is very ready to cont contribute to strengthening ties between the two countries by developing exchanges in the field of higher education. There are many areas related to national development and lar larger global problems where we might collaborate, including on climate change issues, uh, energy security issues, etc. One of these areas is indigenous knowledge. It is well known that Indonesia has huge diversity. Indonesia has over 700 languages, making up 30% of all the world's languages. You, you might know that we have, let's say, about 17,000 islands with the increase of the, let's say, <laughs> uh, um, sea level. We don't know how many will <laughs> disappear in the near future. Many of these communities are repositories of traditional knowledge of plants, agriculture, and medical practices. Yet, because they are small, they are under threat of extinction. I'm aware that there are world-class scholars working in the areas of language and endangered. The rights of linguistic minorities and the impact of global English on local languages and on economic development, of course, here, yeah, who come from Denmark. One is, sorry for the spelling, Top Skutnab Kangas, I don't know how to spell it, <laughs> a retired professor from the University of Roskilde. The other is Robert Philipson, a professor of the Department of International Language Studies and Com 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 Computational Linguistic of the Copenhagen Business School. We will be extremely happy to have Danish scholars such as these visit us and to generally engage in academic exchanges and join research with Danish universities. However, for the moment, we wish to hear from you about Denmark, Your Excellency, and your plans for cooperation with Indonesia. We look forward to your talk. Hopefully, we will have time for questions. Mr. Lukacov, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can I introduce you uh, for a moment, uh, yep. Your Excellency? I would like to introduce you first. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Ligatov is the Speaker of the National Parliament of Denmark and he's also the leader of the Social Democrat Party. He graduated from University of Copenhagen and has been in several post ministerial posts uh, like Minister of Finance and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Ligatov is the right person to talk about democracy and corruption for many reasons, but for this equation I will only mention two, which is that firstly, Denmark is sorry. Denmark has a long tradition of uh, democracy. Uh, national parliament has been introduced. Democratic parliament has been introduced since 1849. So we, I think, need to learn a lot from Denmark with what we have done in Indonesia so far. And secondly, 
uh, Denmark has been considered as the second least corrupt countries in the world. The Transparency International has ranked Denmark in number two, uh, surpassed only by New Zealand, in the Corruption Perception Index 2011. So, Mr. Ligatov is a very right person to talk about democracy and corruption. Please. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Madam. Thank you, uh, Rector Gulima, for all your warm words and wise remarks for the introduction of our visit here in this beautiful campus of the University of Indonesia. Uh, I have seen the poster here as an expression of how our two national flags are interwoven on this very day uh, and, and that's a pleasant experience because we have received both here at the university but also earlier on in our visit to the Parliament of Indonesia very much warm reception and we have already had uh, good discussions with uh, leading members of your Parliament here this morning. We have looked forward the five of us in the Presidium of the Danish Parliament for a long time to this visit in Indonesia. Maybe a few remarks about why we are here. Denmark is far away, yes. We are five and a half million people in the northern part of Europe. Uh, but challenges at this time and day are global. Most of the problems you are fighting with are also problems we are fighting with and have to contribute to the to solutions of one. Uh, the actor Gulima uh, uh, mentioned the climate change uh, challenges which are very putting more and more heavy burdens on especially some of the poor developing countries of this world, where we, in our part of the world, in Europe, in the United States as well, uh, have a strong obligation to be in the forefront in trying to combat global warming, to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, and in that way also contributing to, this, uh, to the solution of the problems you are facing in this part of the world. But. Uh, in addition to that, you can say that this is also a field of uh, big opportunities for mutual cooperation. Uh, Danish companies have uh, developed important technologies in energy conservation and uh, renewable energies, uh, uh, in, in environmental energies in general, where we can uh, contribute uh, also in this part of the world and, and in fact Denmark has had a program of cooperation with Indonesia exactly uh, on, on these issues and are still uh, going on with it. Uh, we have of course also looked forward to come to Indonesia because uh, we have observed the rapid transition in your country we have observed that you are a powerhouse of economic growth in recent years. You have this huge population, around nearly 50 times as big as our population. Uh, you are the largest working democracy of Muslim majority population in the world. And uh, you are a to an uh, ever ex increasing extent uh, a front player in uh, strengthening the regional cooperation in this part of the world with ASEAN and all the other regional uh, institutions in Asia and Asia Pacific region. So for that reason we have and we are I should add in Denmark, little Denmark is now this first half of 2012 uh, the, the, have the presidency of the European Union. 
So we, we have, I think, a common interest in working with the strengthening of regional organizations in order to fight global problems. So that, that, that's some of the reasons why we're here. Uh, and you have asked me to give some remarks on, on, on Danish experiences with democratic development, fight against corruption, and so on, and try to do that. And I will also try to add some remarks to the characteristics that the rector took forward about the Danish model, the, the Danish uh, social model, as we have developed it over the decades. First, Denmark, uh, as Madame said, Den the Danish democracy started at small scale, one could say, uh, more than 160 years ago in 1849 with the first free constitution. That was not democracy in the modern sense of the word. Women and poor people didn't vote. But it was the first time that part of the, uh, the, the ordinary population uh, was equipped with the right to vote for a parliament that could give the laws of the Kingdom of Denmark. And gradually, in a process of at least 50 years, but uh, in reality even longer, we developed uh, uh, the kind of democratic mo model we're using now. After some 50 years, the king recognized the parliamentary system of Denmark meaning that it was the majority of the parliament that should decide who should be the government. And voting rights were extended uh, to everybody now, every Danish citizen over the age of, of 18. Uh, and the uh, individual rights and freedoms were stated even more clearly in the constitutions uh, up to the present one who has been working since 1953. Uh, the Danish political system in this past hundred years has actually been a system, a multi-party system. No single party has had the power to decide everything. Governments most often have been not majority governments, but minority, often minority coalition governments, one, two, three parties going together, but being dependent on one or more other parties in parliament for the support of their proposals. And that has meant a long tradition of on important areas of politics to, to use a consensus model, include more or less when you had center-left governments, also the center-right parties and the other side around on important issues of, for instance, legislation on, on the public school, where we have had broad compromises, broad agreements between the parties for decades and decades. Uh, but when, when we talk about the reasons why we are s scoring so high in the uh, Transparency International Index, very low corruption and so on. It has to do with a lot of things. It has to do, I think, with the minority government tradition. It has to do with uh, the uh, Danish democracy being developed and carried forward uh, by strong NGOs, you could say, non-government organizations, but especially at the beginning of our democracy, uh, the cooperatives and uh, farmers' cooperatives, the workers' trade unions, were Im very important tools for the democratic development and for the participation of ordinary people in the decision making in society. Denmark is a very organized society. Nearly everybody belongs to some kind of organization. And uh, we have had, when you talk about the Danish model, we have had strong involvement of strong organizations also in the preparedness of, of legislation over the years. And there's been a kind of, of uh, division of labor between the organizations of uh, 
labor and industry on the one side making their collective agreements on labor market conditions and the leg legislation we have uh, made in, in the parliament. But we have also, and I think here we have experiences worth exporting. We have also developed strong institutions connected with the parliament in order to supervise government and administration. We have a strong independent Auditor General institution, well staffed, well paid, well educated people who are taking uh, a firm look on the way the government spends the money. Not only that they only use the money in accordance with the budget law, but also that they use the money in a wise way. The transparency in the handling of taxpayers' money is extremely essential for a true democratic development. And then we have developed as one of the first nations, together with Sweden, uh, the Ombudsman Institution. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, that institution, but that's a person with an organization behind him who is equipped with the powers to go in and uh, when a person is in some kind uh, of conflict with the administration, with the authorities, with the public servants, with the government, uh, they can go to him, they can say, uh, we think we are not uh, being treated the right way, and he can, he can uh, make his comments on that. But the, the good thing about it is that nearly every time the Ombudsman makes a judgment, a recommendation, his authority is so strong that it's followed by the administration or the government as it is the fact with the, the uh, Auditor General's recommendations and, uh, uh, sent through the Public Accounts Committee uh, and Parliament to the administration. So when we talk about the absence of uh, corruption, of transparency, it has much to do with this institutional setup. And both the uh, Audit Institution and the Ombudsman is not funded by the government, but by decisions in the parliament. Also in that way strengthen the division of powers between parliament and government. Uh, but transparency, of course, uh, also has a lot to do with the working of the media. The freedom of the press, and the response, uh, uh, responsible and effective use of the media of the freedom of the press is a very important factor in uh, ensuring the transparency of, of, of uh, the state in general. One point more, which will bring me on to some more, more global observations on, on uh, the workings of democracy. I think that the fact, as Rector pointed out, that we have been able to create a society in Denmark and the other Nordic countries and a number of other European countries where distribution of income and wealth is rather equal, also contributes to uh, the, the good working of democracy. What do I mean with that? My point is, that maybe the strongest challenge to the intended principles of democratic government is if big money take controls over political parties and the political scene. You can, you can illustrate that in many ways and it's not, it's not uh, it's, it's rather common around the world that, that the, uh, 
where you have big inequalities, very strong monopolies of economic power, they also execute, execute uh, big influence on the political system and the media. And in a way, are able to twist uh, the whole scenery of political decision making and up to the uh, internet revolution at least, also the information accessible for most people. Think of Italy under Berlusconi or think of Murdoch in Britain or whatever. Uh, think of even back in 1960, President Eisenhower of the United States before leaving office warned against the military industrial complex in the United States, being too influential also on the political scene. I think that was not a warning listened to. I think we, if you look at the United States today, uh, big money, big industrial institutions, big companies have a huge influence on both political parties there. But you could you could expand this argument further. You could say we had, we got a financial crisis four years ago, maybe because of the lack of control with some huge financial institutions, maybe only nine of them on the global scene, being able to pay themselves out of the necessary control with their activities and make it, making it possible for them to drive a very big part of the world out in a financial crisis through their uh, gambling away uh, the, uh, a lot of money uh, in the global economy. So there are some very fundamental questions, I think, uh, also present in this country about the workings of democracy, the balance of the democratic institutions towards the, the economic powerhouses uh, you have. And, and of course, there is a special, special phenomenon which is difficult to deal with in those countries where authoritarian or, or dictatorial regimes uh, were taken out, disappeared, but where the functionaries of those systems were able in the transition process to take over huge part of the national wealth uh, and uh, concentrate themselves as oligarchs. We see that in Russia. You may see something of it also in your country. Uh, this, these uh, kind of problems uh, puzzles me a lot. And uh, it was summarized, actually, when I had a conversation with Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel uh, Prize winner in economics last spring when he was in Copenhagen, where he, he uh, summarized all this in the discussion. Maybe the problem is that we only have the best government money can buy. Well, that was the remarks uh, I had on transparency and democracy development uh, and then maybe uh, just a few words as a comment uh, to what uh, Rector said about our Danish model. Uh, I, 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 can, I can tell you the way to the internet to, to read a little book I wrote about it. Uh, I will not uh, go through all of it but I think that you are rightly pointing out that some of the most interesting characteristics of Danish and Nordic societies uh, are the, uh, as you mentioned, the rather equal distribution of wealth and income, the rather equal participation of women, men and women on the labor market and in the whole life of society, and the uh, demonstration that uh, that growth and social justice, a rather high level of taxes, is not necessarily in contradiction to each other. Uh, because 
Well, you can have a high level of taxes, but if you use the taxes in a way that it increases your social harmony and your competitiveness as a nation on education, on research and so on, on infrastructure, on kindergartens, because otherwise the women would not be able to participate in the labor market at the same amount of, as men and so on. If you, if you use the money appropriate and wise, it will not be a, a, a burden for competitiveness, but a precondition for the competitiveness you have, have reached. That, that's a, a, an interesting observation. I will not in any way say that we can, this model can be exported. You can take it in Indonesia. No, it's much more difficult than that. And, and m many of the characteristics of the Danish society were something we developed over decades and decades and are still correcting because we are not without challenges either. We, are, the, we, we cannot say for sure that what we managed to do, we are able to continue for, for decades to come. We are not able to say that, uh, that we are ne necessarily able to maintain our status as one of the richest countries in the world, because you people are competing very hard, not only in Indonesia, but in, in most of Asia. Uh, and and that's, that's at least presenting us with a long row of challenges. The short version being that with so many people successfully going for better life, better living standard, as we see all over in Asia, China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, whatever. The, the better life we will all have in the coming decades is not exactly the type of life we have had because the new situation is that resources will be scarce, that oil and gas, traditional energy resources will be scarce, minerals will be scarce, uh, even uh, uh, meat will be scarce or so, when everybody uh, is uh, going to have more. And that, that uh, means that you cannot necessarily copy the way we have been rich, but we will not be rich in the same way we were, because uh, the market mechanisms and hopefully uh, early political de decisions also in, in fighting climate change and so on will, will mean that we will have to change our uh, lifestyle, our way of life not necessarily worse, but surely very, very different from what we used to have. That was the few words of, I should like to, to give for this discussion. I'm sure all my colleagues here maybe not exactly agree with me on everything, but they will surely be very happy to participate in a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for a very inspiring speech. Um, for your information, ladies and gentlemen, this program is broadcast uh, through web streaming. So anybody in the world, including in Denmark, can watch our program. And actually, they can also ask questions. Uh, so you are on the web. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite questions from audience. I have, OK. I'll, Five, one, one, two, three, four, one more, five, okay, please. Please identify your name and university. For your information, we invite not only for students from our university, but also several universities around Jakarta. Yeah, please. Okay, good evening, Mr. Mons Lichtoff. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Darwin from the Institution of Social and Politics of Jakarta. Uh, my question is, as rectors of Indonesia says that Indonesia was a very rich country, but in here we have some trouble because of, the, of some of corruptor in, in Indonesia, Indonesia's government, our nation be nothing now. We are in chaos now. So, may may I help? I may I 
ask you some help and advice. What is your advice to finish corruption in Indonesia to become a clean government as Denmark's government? Maybe that's it. Thank you for your okay. concern. Second question, yes. Uh, yang ketiga, tolong berdiri di standby. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, yeah, hello, Joe. Yeah, yeah, will, yeah, will per at here in Spersmar Podensk. Please identify yourself. My name is Joe. I go to a uh, uh, University of Indonesia. I take physics, but I am interested in corruption and politics as well because we do live it every day. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, hello, Denmark for sure. Um, oh yeah, 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 Denmark. They are, they are, they are good land. Okay, means Persma. Yeah, yes, yeah, Persma means Persma for English. You better ask in English, yes. Yeah, for the. Good to know you've been in Denmark. Do you think this Danish model you have could be applied if your population was, let's say, not as much as in Indonesia, but let's say probably four times or five times more bigger? than it is now, so for example, 30, 40 million people. And second of all, second of all uh, corruption, about corruption. Do you think corruption in Denmark is so low because there's people constantly auditing what the government is doing? Or is it, bec or it because it comes from within? It's because of your culture, it's because how you grew up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, the third. Well, thank you for the chance. My name is Chatur from International Relations Department of this university. Um, my question will be, maybe it's too late, because I'm questioning about the 2005 case where there is a media in Denmark called Gillen Posten or something? Gillen Posten that uh, picturized the cartoon of Pro uh, Islamic Prophet Muhammad. My question would be first, how is the, uh, how is the cu current government of the uh, Denmark, or especially in the national parliament of Denmark, in respecting any indi individual's rights, since you, um, in this previous speech, also mentioned about respecting individual rights. So my question would be how the current policy of the national parliament of Denmark, especially the government of Denmark, respecting individual, individual rights, especially um, Muslims community in, Euro in Europe or in Denmark. And the second question would be how then the, the government of Denmark relates to the media, how the governments of um, Denmark controls the freedom of the media so that the, the media can be responsible for everybody else in Denmark. Thank you very much. The fourth, please. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Artika. I'm from the International Relations of University of Indonesia. So my question is pretty much, uh, may, may be the same with the first questions, but uh, how to abolish corruption in our country? As we know, it's already deep-rooted, but I would like to know from the small action so everybody can participate in it. Thank you. Number lima. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Andra from Institute of International Liberation in Jakarta. Uh, my first question may be that um, already asked before I'm start talking about um, caricature uh, of our prophet Nabi Muhammad. Uh, there is someone who asked before me, so I just want to ask how about mu um, Muslim Populity in uh, Denmark. Mus Muslim uh, community in Denmark. How about uh, the Muslim community Muslim in Denmark? Denmark? Yes. How uh, about their uh, freedom of speech? How about their freedom of act? How about their freedom to um, express themselves in, uh, you know, um, in minority uh, groups? Secondly, uh, I just want to ask your uh, personal opinion um, you know the Transparency International um, makes uh, I'm sorry the Transparency International is point your country at the second most clean country in the world now uh, because in Indonesia that has been um, a great debate about how we punish the corruption, uh, the corruptor. Mm, 
I just want to ask, uh, how about um, your opinion, opinion about sentence of death for the corruption, like mm -hmm. in China? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that it against the human of right. So, what is your personal opinion about that? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Very far-reaching questions. I'm not sure I'm able to give a full answer to everything. Uh, and I'm certainly not capable of saying in any kind of detail how you should fight corruption more efficiently in Indonesia. I know that the, pres the, the present, uh, president of the Republic of Indonesia have fought two uh, election campaigns on his program to fight uh, corruption. I know also that there has been uh, a number of cases already raised, uh, but I think that it has uh, fighting corruption more efficiently, and corruption is a problem in nearly every developing economy in the world. Uh, China, India uh, as well, Russia certainly. Uh, so it, it's not unique to your country and it, it has a lot to do with the level of, of, of real income and the structure of society. And every step taken to modernize the economy, to integrate it more in the international market, to make a, 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 a competitive uh, environment for business life, to, uh, to fight monopolies grounded maybe back in authoritarian times, uh, all that will be essential steps, part of the solution. But it also take the building of a lot of stronger and more independent institutions. As I said, I mentioned the examples from Denmark of the, uh, both the respect and the authority uh, given to the uh, auditing organization and to the ombudsman institution, uh, just to mention those two. Uh, and then I think and uh, there was uh, the young lady, uh, the la uh, second last to ask questions, I, I think you asked about w what kind of small actions can you, can you uh, uh, take in order to focus more on this. I think that the, the uh, attention paid by the ordinary people and hopefully flew uh, strong attention from the public, also by the media, whoever is owners of the media, using the uh, new possibilities of the internet, which I think is a very, very strong force, to expose uh, examples of corruption is a, is a very, very important thing. And then I think uh, and I have no, no uh, final answer to that, but I think it's important that we all, being in our part of the world or your part of the world, is considering how we can make political parties less dependent on big money. We have, in our system, taken some steps in that direction because we have a, uh, tax paid public support for the political parties uh, in accordance with the number of votes they get in a general election. So that the political parties today in Denmark are much less dependent on subsidies from outside, from, be it from business life or trade unions than they used to be. And th that I think can also be a part of the answer to the challenges we are facing here. Uh, I was asked also if death penalty was a solution. The answer is no. 
I don't think death penalty is a solution on anything. I think we have to fight against death penalty in every form in every country of the world because it doesn't s solve any problems and we must not, never take the risk of taking the lives of people who may not necessarily be uh, uh, the, the real perpetrators who can be uh, wrongly accused. We have seen many examples of that and I consider it a higher level of civilization to ban capital punishment in, in, your, in your country. That will not necessarily happen if you have a referendum about it. Therefore, you should never have a referendum about it. Uh, I was asked if the, uh, yeah, the, the question about corruption was also uh, associated to how much is, uh, when it, the level is very low in Denmark, how much has to do with the auditing, how much has to do uh, with the, uh, the culture. It's a mixture. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that if you, ha you had weak institutions and, major and continuously majority governments in a country like Denmark, we would have more corruption. So it's, it's, it's actually very important to maintain the strong institutions and probably also the minority governments, <laughs> which is not a problem, but uh, nearly always comes out in general elections in Denmark. Uh, but of course it has also something to do with the culture. It has, and, and I forgot that one, it has also to do with creating the funding for decent wages to the public servants. Whole, the whole area of petty corruption, which is uh, very, very wide uh, in many countries, has to do with the incredible low wages for those who, who should take care of the public interest being a policeman, the school teacher, whatever. So it also has to do with organizing the society so that the taxes will come to the state to pay the decent wages for the policeman and the school teacher. And that has also something to do with fighting the corruption in the other end. Then there was uh, a couple of questions connected with the so-called cartoon crisis in Denmark. And, 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 and my personal view is that even if you have the widest possible freedom of expression, you should never use your hand more than it doesn't touch the face of your brother. That's a, a, a quotation from Bishop Tutu in South Africa. Mm. And I can say, tell you for sure there is no Danish government or na no Danish parliament that want to, to insult the, the uh, one and a half, two billion Muslim citizens of the world or their creed. We will not have any intention of that. But there is no Danish government either that has any influence on what's written in a newspaper or drawn of cartoons in a newspaper. We have, a, we have laws saying that you, that, that, that you, you must not, uh, there are certain uh, insults you cannot uh, do towards people and maybe also to, towards uh, religious figures. But that's a question for the judiciary, not for the government, not for the parliament to sort out. There was connected with this question uh, uh, also a question about how is the uh, freedoms of the Muslim community in Denmark. And the Muslim community in Denmark has exactly the same freedoms and rights to expression, uh, having their culture, having their religion, as everybody else. 
there are not very many Muslims in Denmark, but there, are, the, there is a community composed of people of Turkish, Arab, Pakistani origin mainly that, that went to Denmark to work uh, decades ago. Their family had become after them and they are there and most of them are active, hardworking citizens of the Kingdom of Denmark and they have every freedom uh, that any other in Denmark has. But of course everywhere you have problems with integration. When people with very different cultures and religions come together. I, I said we see that everywhere in Europe. I think you see that many places in Asia also. And we're working hard with that. The former government did it. My colleague was uh, for 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 a period. Uh, Bell Holler was for a period minister of integration. Uh, this new government of Denmark is doing whatever we can to improve the integration and participation of every man and woman from the Muslim community in Denmark, uh, in Danish society and Danish labor market. I think that was at least an effort to answer the questions. Thank you, Your Excellency. Unfortunately, uh, we have to close now because the delegation have to leave for the uh, library and then have to leave for Jakarta. They have to be in the hotel very at before four or five o'clock. Thank you for the speech, uh, Your Excellency. Um, now is the uh, token of appreciation from University of Indonesia, uh, delivered by uh, Professor Gubernur Sumantri. <laughs> and I would like to invite the delegation from the Kingdom of Denmark to stand up to take a photo session with the uh, director. Photo session. Thank you for uh, your visit to University of Indonesia. Uh, Bapak Ibu yang terhormat, adik adik mahasiswa, demikian acara kita. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya. Semoga uh, program hari ini membawa sesuatu uh, ilmu maupun experience dan tadi yang sudah dijelaskan tentang Denmark dan kemungkinan besar membawanya kembali untuk apa meningkatkan demokrasi dan uh, anti korupsi di Indonesia. Selamat sore dan selamat beraktivitas. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.